Welcome to Grace Church. We're glad that you can join us and connect with our church here. For the best online experience, download the Grace Church app and choose the Sunday morning tab. From there, you can take notes, find a Bible, and fill out a response card. You can also find all of our past messages there in case you want to watch, rewatch, or share. Grace Church Online is made possible by faithful and generous people just like you. If you would like to contribute to the work and ministry of Grace Church, you can do that through the app or at www.worcestergrace.org. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. Man, it might be gray out there, but it's full of life in here. You are here on a great Sunday because we're kicking off our brand new series from the book of James. And we're talking about grit when you want to quit, right? And, and uh, this weekend kicked off college football. Did anybody watch any football this weekend? Got excited about that? Yeah? Well, one of the biggest upsets in the history of college football happened yesterday. Uh, there was a little school out of Virginia that my wife and I attended, and they made a road trip and were 34.5. I never really know how they figure out a half a point, but 34 and a half point underdogs, and they won. And they had a huge upset, and we were so excited, and I was like jumping for joy, and no one cares at all except for the few of us that are there. And they got so excited at Liberty University that they canceled classes tomorrow, right? It's amazing, absolutely amazing. They're going nuts. People told me, oh, they have no chance, man. They should totally quit, but they showed some grit, and we were thrilled, right? It, it reminded me this week, uh, my daughter said to me, hey, Dad, Daddy, can we play Candyland? And I was like, sure, because I like five-minute games, right? And so we sit down, we, we drag mom into the mix, right? And you remember the Candyland board, right? It's just a really quick game. You draw all the cards and everything. And, and so I, I got out to a rather large early lead, and we live in a very competitive family. And so I may have bragged a little bit like, ah, oh, dad's winning, you know, and everything. And I was one turn away from getting to the candy castle, right? The King Candy, right? That's a scary-looking dude. But anyway, King Candy. And I draw the card, and no kidding, I draw the candy cane card. So I have to go all the way back down here, and my daughter's laughing, you know, and oh, daddy, you know, and everything. And then I realized, you know, I try to play it off and teach her a lesson, like it's okay to lose and everything. But then I realized that my wife was now in the lead, and she was going to win the game. And when she did, next couple turns, she wins. And so I got to paint this face. I'm like, congratulations, dear, you know, because I'm faking it because I'm competitive deep down. I want to win, yes, even at Candyland, right? Okay, and so I'm trying to teach my daughter this, and she wanted nothing to do with it. She was so frustrated. She takes her blanket and just absolutely destroys the table or the, the game piece and everything, game over, right? So we had a chance to teach her right there, teachable moment, on what it means to have some grit when you would rather quit, right? That's what we're talking about. About today grit what is this idea of perseverance or grit and we're going to be in the book of James chapter 1 so open up your Bible to James chapter 1 the next several weeks we're going to discover uh, the theme of the book of James is faith that works and today we're going to look at how that faith that works it intersects with our everyday lives in the form of grit and listen you cannot read the book of James and stay the same it changes us from the inside out. Everyday life, real faith, where they meet. James talks about that all over his book. And so that's what we're going to do today. And, and really, we all have faced moments in our lives where we've wanted to quit, right? Where we've wanted to throw in the towel. Forget it. It's not worth it. And it's not going how I planned. And so I'm ready just, I, I'm done. I, I quit. I, I don't want to go on. I don't want to try any harder, right? We've all been there. As a matter of fact, I want to take a poll this morning, wherever you're at watching this. I want to know, if you have ever even thought about quitting at something, I want you to raise your hand. Raise your hand. Put your hands up there. Keep them up. Keep them up. Okay, look around. Okay? You are not alone. Anybody that doesn't have their hands raised? 
I don't want to call him a liar from the stage, but I'm telling you, we've all been tempted to quit at something. All of us have. I know I've been tempted to quit. We get discouraged at certain things, like people behave a particular way and it discourages us. They say something about us. Or they, they pass us up for a promotion at work. And so we become discouraged and we want to quit. Or life just keeps piling things on top of us and we get overwhelmed by stressful situations and things that don't go how we planned. And so we become beat up by life. Maybe it's an illness. And so we become defeated, right? And as soon as you are discouraged and you're defeated over and over and over again, pretty soon you end up with some despair. And despair is an awful place to be because it's when you lose your sense of hope. You become hopeless about the situation, and so you end up throwing in the towel, uh, maybe even a little premature, because you're, you don't have any hope. You don't see any reason to continue on. You're absolutely in despair. And so you get to that point where you're discouraged, or you're defeated, or you're in despair, and you just want to yell out loud, I quit! And we're more mature than a four-year-old, right? We don't flip the board over and get mad. I bet we would if we could. And unfortunately, I bet some of us in here struggle with anger to that point that we actually might. So what do you do rather than quit? What's the other alternative? Trials and temptations and troubles, they constantly make us want to quit. But the book of James kicks off by giving us an alternative. As a matter of fact, the book of James is written by a guy named... That was not a trick question. The book of James is written by a guy named James, and he identifies himself right there in verse 1. He goes, James, that's me. That's the half-brother of Jesus. And he gives us this theme throughout the book of faith that works. And right away in verse 2, he jumps into the action. And this is what he says. He says, listen, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. When you're reading that, you're kind of like, what? It's kind of like a smack in the face right off the bat in the book. Now, when you are, have been a follower of Christ or you've been around the faith or you like to share spiritual things or verses from the Bible, you've probably seen this verse before. And you're like, yes, we should consider it joy when we're, you know, things aren't going the way we want them to go. That's great for you to give some verbal affirmation to it. But let's take a look at your life when it actually doesn't go the way you want it to go. Do you act like that? Uh, James is saying, hey, listen, when you're ready to call it quits, call it joy. What? He can't possibly be serious. Oh, but he is. And so that's going to require something that's, frankly, a little bigger than you and me. This is more than grinding your teeth to make it through in life. And James says, hey, listen, you're going to have to display some perseverance when you face trials. And there's a lot of different kinds of trials, right? We are so, this is so, like, away from us. We don't even know how to connect with this. It's unrelatable for us to consider calling what happens that we don't like, calling that joy or having joy in the middle of it. Because we don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't like insecurity. James says, hey, listen, there's a lot of trials in life. And it takes the right mindset to kind of persevere through them. You don't think there's a lot of trials in life? Think about the, the middle schooler who's going to school in middle school for the first time, and he's got the trials and troubles of his peers picking on him, and he, he can't wait to get over that. And he's like, I, if I just can't wait till I get to high school, then maybe all this immaturity will go away. And so he goes to high school. And in high school, he, he starts to get some freedom. He gets his driver's license, and he gets a lot more freedom, and, and his parents are trying to restrict that to keep him safe and help him have discipline, right? And, and, and so he's like, man, I can't stand the curfew and the rules. My troubles will just vanish when I can finally get out of this place and go to college. And so he goes to college, and he learns the word called tuition and debt. And so he gets two jobs. He starts working his tail off, and he's like, man, this is, this is terrible. I can't wait till I finally get out of college and get a job uh, that pays me good money that I don't have to have these troubles anymore. And then he meets a girl, and they fall in love. They're holding hands, looking in each other's eyes, and they're like, man, pretty soon 
we can be Mr. and Mrs. And he proposes, and she, she says yes. And they're like, man, whenever we get married, then all of our troubles will go away. <laughs> okay. And so they get married. And the mystery of the Bible comes alive where two lives become one. She moves in and takes over. And so they're trying to figure those trials out. Like, how do you make this work? And they, they finally figure that out and they decide to have a kid because they don't have any trials. <laughs> and maybe they try for a couple years and they're not very successful. And it leads to some major stress and a big time trial. And then by God's grace... They're able to have a kid, and we'll, we'll just kind of avoid the nine-month trials and temptations of pregnancy, right? And, and, and she gives birth to a baby girl, their little princess, and they're so thrilled, and they, they bring the baby home, and they put the baby down, and she falls asleep, and they're laying exhausted on the bed, and they're talking about life and how blessed they are, and it's amazing, and oh my goodness, we, we've wanted this for so long, now all of our troubles are gone, and they fall asleep for 30 seconds. <laughs> and then the baby screams and wakes them up. And then they realize that there's, there's trials and troubles in every stage of parenthood, right? Uh, there's, there's the, hey, if they can get them to sleep through the night, and then the potty training phase, whoa, good luck there. And then, you know, then there's school, and then there's discipline, and then there's character, and then there's driver's license, and you want them to get it, and then you want them to be safe. And then uh, their daughter, like, uh, they pray that, uh, that she'll find the guy that'll treat her right for so many years, and then she starts dating, and then they pray she doesn't find that guy, right? loaded with trials. And that whole time you're trying to do parenting, you're still going to work. And at work, when things are really, really good and it's busy, you're having a hard time balancing work and home. And so it creates a trial. And then when things aren't good and the economy tanks and there's not enough work to go around, there's a trial there. Like, I don't know if I'm going to have a job. And so you're battling all these trials and then eventually you stop and you think, man, when I retire, that's when I'll have peace and no more trouble. And so you retire and then you realize you miss the camaraderie. And then you start thinking about health issues. And you start facing your own mortality right in the eyes. And you realize, man, life is absolutely loaded with trials. Trials of various sizes. The really, really big ones like health and illness. And even the really, really small ones, like I can't get Wi-Fi here, right? Life is loaded with them. And then James comes in in this great book in the Bible and he says, When all of that happens to you, consider it joy. Why would anybody do that? Well, he tells us. Look at verse 3. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And when you let perseverance finish its work, you become mature and complete, and you don't lack anything. So the goal is to become mature or complete or not lacking anything. That's the goal of life. That's the goal of the life that is lived in following Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. Nobody really wants this deep, deep down on their own. Nobody's like, yes, I want to be mature and complete. Okay, well, that's going to involve suffering. Okay, I'm out now. I quit. Right? Nobody signs up to suffer. Nobody wants a trial. Nobody wants trouble. But listen, the path to maturity runs right through difficulty. And whatever trial or trouble you're facing, there's a chance that God's able to use this to make you complete. And so rather than throwing in the towel and quitting, rather than quitting on the game of life, how about this? What if faith that works would show some grit when you're tempted to quit? What if that is the point that James is getting after here, that we need some grit in our lives? Listen, about a year ago, I was studying the book of James. And I was sitting in the garage of our temporary house after we were displaced. And I was at a really low point. And I was reading a book called Grit by a psychologist named Angela Duckworth. And it's a story of inspired people who, who persevered. Good book, but not as good as this book. And I'm sitting there, and I'm not going to be honest with you, I was ready in a couple places to just throw in the towel. I couldn't put it all together. I couldn't put everything back. 
I couldn't handle all of the new responsibilities being thrown at me at the same time. It was absolutely overwhelming, and that's when it clicked. That grit and perseverance is not something that I can manufacture on my own. It's something that is birthed by faith in God and is developed by faith in God inside of me. It is a gift to us through faith. And that in this moment, in this trial, in this trouble, God has something really amazing. And that he is way bigger than whatever trouble I've got. Grit. Grit. That's what comes out of faith that works. Grit. Not going to quit. I'm going to show some grit. And so uh, James continues on in chapter 1, and he gives us some ways that we can develop uh, this idea of perseverance and grit so that we can allow God's Spirit to fan uh, the faith in us to produce this grit. And there's really three ways, and I want to share them with you today. First one is this. Ask for help. You're going to need to ask for help to see it his way because God's way is not our way. It's not even close. It, it reminds me of the, of the movie of a couple years ago, Bruce Almighty. There's this TV reporter named Bruce who is played by Jim Carrey, and, and he's kind of frustrated with God. At one point in the movie, he says, God is a mean kid sitting on an ant hill with a magnifying glass, and I'm the ant. He could fix my life in five minutes if he wanted to, but he'd rather burn off my feelers and watch me squirm. And so he's always complaining about God and how life is tough and he just wants to quit. And finally, he has an interaction with God. And God is played by Morgan Freeman in this movie. And he confronts Bruce and he says, you know what? You've been complaining an awful lot about me. So here, here why don't I just put you in charge for a little while? And Bruce is like, sweet. I got the power, you know. And he, he displays all this power. But then he starts to understand the complexity of it all. And he starts getting all these prayer requests sent to his inbox. And so he has to come up with a database, and he organizes it. And all in one swoop, he's like, I can't handle this anymore. I'm just going to say yes to everybody. And 400,000 people win the lottery, and they all share $17, right? It's true. That's because we need help to see it God's way. And, and our life can turn on a dime. One phone call. One text. Everything was going good with your marriage. Everything was going good with your kids. Everything was going good with your job. One text, one phone call, one message can turn everything upside down. And in that moment, do you see it God's way? James says you're going to have to ask. Look at verse 5. If you lack wisdom, you should ask God. And what does God do? He gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to you. Wisdom. Now, James is not saying, hey, you know what? Most of you have enough within you to kind of figure it out, you know? You can figure out pretty much all the problems in life, except when it comes to the really big ones. And when you get to a really big problem in life, just go ahead and call on God's help. No, he says, listen, you need God's help every single day. You should be asking him for wisdom. Wisdom is when you see things from his perspective. You understand that while I have this trial, while I have this trouble, God has a plan. And he wants to use it to change me. You see, we need help. We need that wisdom from God because we have a limited perspective. We limit the view of what God is doing all the time. Look at verse 6. James talks about it. He says, but when you ask, he's basically saying don't limit yourself. you got to believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Verse 8, such a person is double-minded, and they're unstable in all they do. We constantly limit the perspective of God because we're, we're like a walking civil war inside. We have two, battle, or two sides to this battle going on. We have us and God, and we are born with the tendency to want to go our way rather than God's way. And we're pushed and pulled in so many different directions that don't honor God. So where in life do you need help to see his perspective? What trial and what trouble do you face that you need to ask him? It's called prayer. And it doesn't have to be fancy. And it doesn't happen on a stage. It doesn't have to be grandiose words. It's a conversation with God. God, 
help me see this your way. If you're a follower of Christ, this is a no-brainer for you. But I have to ask, the last trial or trouble you faced, was this what you did first? Or did you go complain or tell somebody on Facebook about it? Ask for his perspective. Second way that you can cultivate this grit. you got to decide who you're going to trust. To make a decision on who you're going to trust. See, uh, we keep a scorecard in our life, and it's typically around the things that make us feel safe. And the things that make us feel safe are the things that we have. It's our stuff. And, and we're, we're a culture that's very impressed with money and wealth and all the things that come with it. The bling, the flash, the cars, the toys, you know. All these bodyguards and the lifestyle, the whole nine yards. We get impressed by that. God's not impressed by that. He has a completely different scorecard. And so when life turns on a dime, and you get that one text, or something didn't go how you thought it would go, or you're frustrated because you're not winning, who do you trust? I think we're tempted to trust ourself and our stuff. That's what we trust. And so James kind of gives a word about this. He uses money as an example to make his point about who we're going to trust. First, he's going to give a word to people who don't have a whole lot of money. He says, if you're in humble circumstances, you ought to take pride in your high position. Listen, if you don't have a whole lot of money and you're not putting your stock in that, God's not embarrassed by you. He's not embarrassed to be with you as you walk down the street just because you don't have a smartphone. He doesn't care. It doesn't bug him that you're struggling to make ends meet. He, he wants to tell you, listen, your present condition does not determine your final destination. So stop worrying about what you don't have because that's putting trust in yourself and your stuff, even the stuff you don't have. And then he gives a word to people who have money. And he says, hey, but the rich, that's by the way just about everybody in the room, on a world standard, the rich should take pride in their humiliation. Why? Since they will pass away like a wildflower, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers with the plant. Its blossom falls and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. James says, hey, listen, money, it's a big deal, and you're going to try to put your trust in it when something doesn't go how you want it to go. You're going you're to bank on yourself. Uh, money is not the problem. It's simply something printed on a piece of paper. It's what you do with it. It's not about what you have. It's about what you do with what you have. And God is not impressed with your new outfit. And God is not impressed with your newly renovated bathroom. And God is not impressed with your new car. You might be, but he's not. And James says, if you've got some wealth, don't focus on your present condition. If you're a follower of Christ, your focus is on your heavenly position. That's a mindset that produces generosity. That's a mindset that produces grit, that allows all of the things that could get in the way of us blocking grit working in our life. It removes them. Listen, your net worth is of no worth when it comes to your standing with God. When you come before God, it's not about what you bring. If you can imagine the cross where Jesus died in your place as a sacrifice for your sins. When you come to the foot of the cross, whether you have a lot or you don't have a lot, your net worth is of no worth. It's not about what you bring to the cross. It's about what you get at the cross. And what you get is the love and the, the security and the forgiveness of God. Through what Jesus did for you. Trials reveal who we trust. Trials tell us who we trust. James says, the person that trusts God and, and perseveres and their faith is tested and they make it, that person will get the crown of life. They will get the victory. They will live in victory. 
And some of you are trying to figure out different ways to find victory. You're looking for victory in different places in your life. And if you're a follower of Christ and you've come to the cross and you've received his love and forgiveness, the Bible says right there you have the victory. It's not about looking for victory. It's about living in victory. And when you live in victory, you start to look at things different. And you put all of your confidence with God. And then when trials and troubles come, it's not like you walk around obnoxiously like, oh, that doesn't matter. Oh, it hurts. It's still there. But you have a totally different mindset. You're able to call it joy rather than calling it quits. So you have to ask for help to see it his way. You've got to choose who you're going to trust. And then one final way. James shifts gears from talking about troubles and trials, and now he's going to talk about temptation. He says you have to avoid falling to temptation. If you want to have grit be developed in your life, you're going to have to avoid some temptations. Now, I can tell you about one temptation that I have that I constantly struggle with. I struggle with various things, but this is one particular one, and it's when I go to the grocery store hungry, that's a problem. Right? So I'll get sent to the store and I'll be given a list to get maybe milk and bread and I'll go there and I'll get milk and bread and cashews and cream soda and something else, right? And so I go home and I I, I shake my head and shame and I'm like, I'm sorry, dear. I know you sent me for bread and milk, but I got seven other things that looked really, really good because I was hungry, right? So I learned a lesson don't shop hungry. And so a few times ago, I went to the store and there were two things on the list and I got both things on the list and nothing else. I was so proud of myself. I went home. I got in the family room and I was like, dear, guess what? I only got what was on the list. And my wife went on a smile that was dripping with sarcasm. She's like, really good job, dear. <laughs> really, I'm so proud of you, you know? Because that's how shallow I can be. Don't go shopping when you're hungry. The principle in life is that you don't go living unsatisfied. It's really easy in a grocery store to tempt somebody that's hungry. It's really easy in life to tempt somebody that's hungry. Someone that's not completely satisfied with who God is. Someone that hasn't surrendered to his way in their life. It's really, really hard to tempt a satisfied person. Are you satisfied with God? James tells us, hey, when temptation comes, you don't have anybody to blame except yourself. He said, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. God can't be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. He says, listen, you you can't blame anybody else. It's not Satan's fault. It's not God's fault. It's not your sister's fault. It's not your dog's fault. It's your fault. We are responsible for our response. And when we're not satisfied with who God is for us, and we're not looking at it from his perspective, and we're not putting our confidence in his plan, it is really easy to tempt us. A lot of people that study this passage don't understand why the quick change that James gives from trials and troubles to temptations. I think it makes sense. When we're not sold out and we're not all in with who Jesus is in our life, it is really easy to trip us up. And James gives us the progression in the next couple of verses. He says, But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, gives birth to death. There's there's really four words that start with the letter D that come out of that. First, there's deception, which is when things on the shelf at the grocery store start making promises in your head that they're never going to meet. Like, you know, buy me, I'm tasty, you know? And so you're deceived by what they're doing, and and it matches your desire in your heart because you're really, really hungry. And so that deception matches the desire, and so you're enticed to get it off the shelf and put it in the cart. And when you do that, you're actually disobeying the list. And some of you look at the list, and you're like, but that list is just created to kill my fun so I can't get what I want. Maybe the list is created to make you healthy and to enjoy life 
the best way possible. And so when you've been deceived and your desire matches it and you disobey, it always leads to death. And all of us are born with death inside of us because we're all born with a tendency to sin. We're born with the tendency to go our own way rather than God's. And we're not going to be satisfied until we figure that out. That's why we keep falling to temptation. We need to set up all the things in our lives that we can to avoid those temptations. But I'm telling you, there's one big thing that will give you the greatest chance to overcome any temptation. It's to be completely satisfied with God. The way to defeat grocery shopping is to stop shopping when you're hungry. The way to defeat temptation is to live satisfied with all that God is for you in Jesus. And then you can stop looking for the victory. And you can start living in it. Your response to troubles and trials will tell you who you trust. One guy said it like this. He said, if we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, then we won't be able to count it all joy. If we live only for the present and we forget about the future, the trials will make us bitter, not better. So there's two lanes to choose from. The one that's about comfort, the material, and the present. Or the one that's about character and spiritual and the future. I think most of us would say we prefer the second. The one that's about character and the one that's about spiritual and the one that's about future. But when you really face it and something doesn't go how you think it should and you're tempted to say, I quit. How do you turn that into joy? The truth of the matter is you can't. You can't on your own. You can't grind your teeth enough to make it all. You can fake it. But it requires the faith of God inside of you to come alive. And in verse 16, James says, Don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift is from our Father. The Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like the shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. That we would become a kind of firstfruits of all he created. If you want to choose that lane that's all about your character and all about the spiritual and all about the future, if you want to develop grit in your life, it comes from the gift of faith that God has given to you. Listen, it's really popular in our culture to think that we humans are kind of good at our core and that God is somehow an ogre and he's mean and he's trying to kill our joy. Do you know, don't be deceived, that it's actually the reverse. That we humans in our core are not good. We're sinful. And our God, He is good. He is a good, good Father who gives us so much. So maybe you would have grit when you're tempted to quit. How do you develop that further? Here's what I want to do with the time we have left. I want you just to spend a couple minutes with God here. So I want everybody to grab this response card that's inside of your worship program or to flip over to the response section of the Grace Church app. And I want, I want you to get that ready. And I want you just to bow your heads. And for a second, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to picture the cross. The cross of Christ. The, uh, the cross where Jesus died for you. Imagine standing at the base of that cross and kind of looking up at it. In your life, as you've come to this moment, do you think that it's the stuff that you've brought with you to this point that's going to get you through? 
It's not what you bring to the cross. It's what you get from it. And maybe today for you, your next step is to receive the gift of God in his forgiveness and his love through Jesus' death on that cross. And maybe you need to, to receive that right here this morning. And a way that you can do that is silently with every head bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you would repeat some words that I would share. You can turn them into your own words. Just say, God, I know you love me. And I know I've sinned. I want to receive your forgiveness for my sin by faith, which I believe is a gift from God. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross in my place. Take control of my life. Help me to have grit. If you echoed those words in your heart to God, we would love to know about it. You can write on that response card. Just write the name Jesus right there. You're trusting in Jesus alone for your forgiveness, for your sins. And I know that many of you in here have already made that decision, and so I want you to just be, imagine yourself standing at the base of the cross, and you're looking up at that cross. That cross, which is the declaration that God is for you. He's not out to get you. He is for you. The message of the cross is the message of good news. And so if the cross is the message of good news, it is power there. There's the power that you need to have grit. And it's completely available to you. It's not about what you've brought to the cross either. It's not about the good things you've done. It's not about the money you've given. It's not about your behavior or your attendance at church. It's all about Jesus and the power he's giving to you. Where do you need that power? What trial are you facing? What trouble do you have? What temptation do you constantly fall to? Where do you need grit today? Would you be so bold on the response card to write the word grit and then to explain the situation that you need it? I want to challenge you, believer, as you're imagining that cross, to stop looking for the victory and start living in it. In the cross comes victory and grit. God, thank you for grit that changes our lives. God, we've all been in places where we wanted to quit. Throw our hands up, walk away. Thank you for the power that's available to us to continue on even when we want to throw in the towel. God, I believe that you could work in our hearts in a way that could only be given credit to you. That this room and this church could be filled with people that live in victory. That display a grit that could only be explained by God. Not on human terms, but on your terms. We thank you for the power that's available when we face trials. It's in Jesus' name. Thanks for being a part of our online community. We hope that this service was just what you needed today. Whether you've been around church your whole life or today is your first time, we believe that God has something for you in your life. People that are growing keep changing. If God revealed a next step for you, would you mind sharing that with us? We would love to pray for you. You can share questions or prayer requests through our app or to info at worcestergrace.org. This online service is made possible through your generous gifts. If you'd like to contribute to the ministry of Grace Church, text Grace Church Woo to 77977 to begin. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you right back here next week at 1015.